Okay, so my name is Shelly Gehring and I'm a Senior Program Manager at MHP Mass Housing Partnership. We thank you for joining us today. This is the third in our four point series of uh, looking at affordable housing trusts as well as the Community Preservation Act. And we are taping this session. So we hope that you'll keep your camera on, but if you would rather not, that's fine. Um, we ask that you keep yourself muted during the session and put questions and comments in the chat and my colleague Katie Bossy and I will be monitoring those and bringing those questions and comments forward as we can. And with that, we're gonna get started. The um, series or the session today is really focusing on the developer perspective in the affordable housing development process. And today we have Kristen Carlson, who is the Director of Real Estate Development from Harbor Light Community Partners with us. And I'm gonna invite Kristen to share her screen and she's going to share some of the work that Harbor Light has done and some of the um, ways, the strategies, and the program, the projects that they've worked on. Thanks, Kristen. Sure. Great. Well, um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Kristen Carlson. I'm the Director of Real Estate um, at Harbor Light Community Partners. We're located in Beverly on the North Shore, so we tend to work around the North Shore region of Boston. Um, and I'm really glad that everyone can join us today. And um, I thank MHP for letting me have a chance to talk a little bit about our work and about um, my own experience from the developer side, um, working in various communities to, to, get, to get affordable housing accomplished. So um, any other announcements, Shelly, or should I start? Okay. You're all set, thanks. <laughs> okay. So I thought, I thought a little bit um, at first about who's involved in creating affordable housing and just thinking about the amazing amount of constituents um, that, are, that are involved. There's the developers, the municipalities, all the lenders. You'll see there's many, many lenders. Um, within a community itself, there's different elements. There's different boards. There's perhaps the zoning board. There's the, um, the select board. There could be the city council and the mayor. Um, so even a municipality in, in itself has many different, many different layers, many different groups. There's the abutters who may feel differently than the people across town who may feel differently from the ZBA. Uh, there's the fire department. You know, we think of, um, you know, certainly our neighbors when we look at new developments. We also think about our future residents, um, people who are going to be living there. So as you think about um, all, the, all the people who come into play for affordable housing, to create something, it's really, it's really a pretty big group. Okay, so today's presentation, um, I'm just gonna walk through, start by walking through um, two critical elements to creating affordable housing. Number one, the funding, and number two, the zoning. Um, I'll just go through sort of overview, what are the typical um, costs and sources of funding for affordable housing? Um, obviously, every project is different and special. Um, so I'm going to just sort of go um, show a sort of general breakout of what the costs and the funding sources typically look like. Um, and then when we get to the case studies, I'll show you some more specifics. Um, then I want to talk about zoning. Um, and I just want to say, you know, creating paths to multifamily zoning is really essential to creating affordable housing. Um, you'll see as we go through the case studies that um, project size um, has a big impact on feasibility and also what kind of funding we can access. Um, and the presence of zoning um, or not, or what the path to that looks like, and there's many different paths, um, also plays into the feasibility of creating the housing. Um, then I'll walk us through uh, three case studies that are all Harbor Light projects. Um, first one in Beverly, the second one in Rockport, and the third one back in Beverly. Um, and then I'll just sort of summarize how municipal leaders and other people who are sort of part of that process can either help um, or, you know, in some cases, hinder the creation of affordable housing. Okay, so this is a metaphor that we use a lot at Harbor Light. So if creating housing is like a car you want to drive, you need two things to be able to drive that car. Number one, you need gas in the tank. And for us, that's the funding. It's what makes the car go. It's what makes the projects happen. We need the funding. Um, unfortunately, you know, in Massachusetts, there was just a 
large economic development bill passed to ensure more of that funding. So thank you for everyone who supported that. Um, it's really important. Um, the second piece is zoning. Zoning is the road, sort of how we get to where we're going. If there's not a path to creating multifamily housing, we can't get anywhere. Uh, so those two things are, are both really important. And I'd say that municipalities can use both of those to help um, or to hinder affordable housing. All right, so this is, um, I'll just walk through this briefly. So when we think about development as the developer, we break it into sources and uses. So for somebody with more of an accounting background, that might sound something like income and expenses. Uses basically just means the costs of the project um, and the sources are all the funding that make it happen. Um, and obviously those have to balance. So typical sources, um, I'll start with local funding. And that can be a variety of things that can be community preservation funding, that can be local home funding, regional home funding. Um, some municipalities will have an affordable housing trust um, that can come into play. Occasionally we see things like CDBG and other, other pieces of funding like that. The next piece um, that's really critical for a lot of these projects is low income housing tax credits. And here I'll start with the um, acronyms here, but low income housing tax credits are also called LIHTC. Um, they come in a few varieties. One is federal. It's a program that actually comes out of the IRS. The tax credits are allocated by the state to create affordable housing projects. We as a nonprofit in turn um, find an investor for those tax credits who contributes equity in exchange for the tax credit. So they, they come at a federal level through the state and then the state of Massachusetts actually has its own low income housing tax credit program um, that they allocate. So this is one, as we go through the case studies, you'll see this is one of the main sources of funding for many of our projects. Um, the state of Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development, also called DHCD, with which many of us are familiar um, and grateful for, <laughs> provides other funding too, which we call soft debt. It's basically loans that do not need to be repaid as long as the affordability is maintained over the course of you know, 30 to 50 years, depending on the funding, um, unless there's significant cash flow uh, coming out of the property, which, which there's usually not. Um, so the state does quite a lot, DHCD does quite a lot to, to fund these projects. Um, other affordable housing grants and programs, occasionally we'll see things, the um, Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston does a program for affordable housing grants that um, is applicable to some projects. Um, there's other grant sources. Some projects do have some element of philanthropy involved with them, although that's maybe more unusual, it depends where you are and what the project is. Um, and then the last piece is what is basically a conventional mortgage. So, you know, something with a um, 20 year term, 30 year amortization, it's basically very similar to the mortgage on your house. It's paid for, um, those, those monthly payments are made um, out of the rent that's collected after you've paid your expenses. And that's what supports the, uh, th that piece of debt. And we call that the PERM loan, permanent loan. Um, and MHP, is actually the perm lender on one of these projects, one of our case studies. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, on the other column, uses, these are the costs of a project. Just broadly, there's the cost to buy the site. It could be vacant land, it could be a building. Next is the construction cost, um, whether it's ground up, um, renovation, reconstruction, usually the biggest number in the budget. Um, development expenses, which are soft costs, architecture engineering, permitting, construction loan interest fees. Uh, then we have developer overhead and fee. And then finally, capitalized reserves. And I'll talk about those a little more in a minute. So yeah, this gives you a sense of, I tried to look at, um, you know, percentage wise, each of these funding sources, how much are they part of the deal? So if you see the pieces that are allocated by DHCD are definitely the lion's share of the sources You'll see the local funding in there at the top. Conventional debt, that really varies a lot, you know, 25%-ish. Um, so I guess the point I want to make here is that lo local sources really are critical to any project, even if they only make up 5% of the actual um, funding for the project. 
It shows um, local involvement and it's really a signal to the state that the municipality has skin in the game. So getting local funding in is really is really critical um, and it's something that's that the state actually looks for and asks us about. Um, so I talked a little bit before about LIHTC. Um, there's federal LIHTC, there's two different flavors. I won't go into too much depth, but 4% and 9% that typically fund about 20 to 40% of the project. Um, these credits are uh, purchased, quote unquote, by investors, which are typically banks. Um, they get the tax credits that they're able to take advantage of. We're at Harbor Light, we're a nonprofit. We can't do anything with tax credits. <laughs> so we um, transfer them to another entity, which is typically a bank who can take um, advantage of the tax credits. And they also get credits under the Community Reinvestment Act. So they're incentivized to invest in these community development projects. Um, Massachusetts, as I mentioned, there's also state LIHTC, which is a great resource. Um, to use the tax credits, the minimum project size is 20 units. Um, that soft debt, those loans that don't have to be repaid um, unless there's cash flow or the project um, loses its affordability. There's a dozen plus different funding programs available for different types of housing. Um, and then the, the perm loan again is that conventional debt piece at the end. And I'll just mention that many of you know the affordable deals typically are designed not to have a ton of cash flow in contrast to like a market rate deal. You know the the debt is typically sized to um, as large as it as large as it can be to still have a little cushion just in case of fluctuations and operations. Um, but they're not these deals are not designed with a lot of cash flow. Um, so and I just it, it, I'm a visual person, so <laughs> I made these two graphs um, just to sort of demonstrate how different affordable housing is from conventional market rate housing. Um, the bottom very greatly simplified, but the bottom graph shows what a conventional market rate deal might look like. Typically, it's equity and debt. So debt is much bigger um, because the rents are higher. Um, equity is, you know, people get, expect to get paid back out of cash flow. Um, in contrast, on the affordable housing side, our rents are not as high because the units are affordable. Um, and so the debt is much lower. We're also not expecting lots of cash flow to be able to pay investors. So that's why the tax credits and the other soft debt are so important. Um, all of this funding, uh, it's fabulous that we have it and we're very, very grateful. It's all, as you can imagine, quite constrained and very competitive. Um, DHCD allocates funding. They have an annual competitive round called, you'll have heard referred to the One Stop, um, which we just submitted last week <laughs> applications for. Um, it's basically a, you know, you submit one application for all these different sources of funding at once, which, which is great. Um, but that happens about annually. Um, it's possible, I've seen it happen, but it's rare to be funded the first time in. So you have to go through iterations of funding applications before you get fully funded, and that's very typical. Um, and it's not unusual to take multiple years to secure all your funding. So as you're watching a developer churn through it, um, it's part of the process. So we always look for aspects that can make our project more competitive. Um, you know, local funding committed early is really, really important. Um, even if it's a nominal amount, it's important. Support letters from the municipality, even just writing a letter in support of the project can be very helpful. Um, we'll talk about this a little more in the case studies, but if, a if there's a city or town that hasn't done affordable family housing recently, um, the, the state will probably tend to look more favorably on family housing than it will on say senior housing at that point. There's an emphasis on the need, there's a need for everything, but on family housing in particular. Um, so if there hasn't been any of that recently, um, a family housing project will be more competitive than a senior housing project. Um, and then readiness to proceed. So the state wants to know we're ready to go, we're shovel ready, we, our drawings are good, we're permitted, we're got all the other funding lined up and we're, you know, as soon as, as soon as we get funded, we're gonna, we're gonna proceed to closing. <clears throat> um, okay, on the uses side, of the balance sheet. So um, construction cost is the largest cost to a project. Um, it really varies a lot. 
you know, over, over the course of the years, we just, you know, we see a lot, you know, there's volatility and what that pricing is going to look like. It depends on location, depends on complexity of the project. Is there an elevator or not? Is it open shop or union? Um, some questions we get asked is, you know, if you just renovate an, an old building, won't that save money? Um, and maybe, maybe not. We recently renovated one that um, it turned out all the structure inside was rotting um, and needed to be replaced. So you just never know until you open it up. Um, land acquisition cost is really key for us when we're looking at a potential new project. We kind of think about it in terms of dollars per unit. So if we think, you know, this could take 30 units at say $35,000 dollars per unit that kind of gives us a ballpark to what's a reasonable acquisition price that could be supported. When it gets to be over about 45,000 per unit, it's really hard to support that. So we have to watch our land costs. Um, and we also look at appraised value too, of course. Um, we look at other, you know, environmentals, is there any contamination? What's the access to transit is very important. Other amenities. Um, and obviously land that's already zoned for multifamily development is, is worth more. Um, and then a note on the developer overhead and fee, which is, you know, between eight, probably and 12%. Question is, are we getting uh, rich? <laughs> I would love to say the answer is yes, but it's no. Um, so I guess one thing I'd want everyone to know is that DHCD actually sets limits on what that funding and what that fee and overhead can look like, and those can't be exceeded. Um, you know, nonprofits, we really use those overhead and fees um, to fund other work done within the organization, like first time home buyer programs, supportive services. And then, it, you know, if you think about how long it takes to get a project from kind of conception to actually um, closing, it might be five years. So that's a lot of overhead to cover over the course of those five years. Um, another question that comes Kristen, up. Is, Kristen, you like to get paid for doing this work too, right? It helps you live, it helps the staff at Harbor Light continue on by having overhead for these projects, right? Oh, uh, yes, of course. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, um, yeah, not just myself, but my colleagues too. It takes a lot of um, dedication and perseverance and a lot of technical capacity to get these done. So um, yes, everyone wants to be compensated <laughs> fairly. Um, but sometimes, you know, I just want to sort of clarify that about the, about the overhead and fees. Um, the reserves small percentage of the uses, but um, there's a couple different types. One is an operating reserve. Most lenders will ask us to capitalize a reserve, so put money in the bank account during construction for at least six months of operations and debt services. And that's if something like, say, a pandemic hits and operations get a little, you know, we start to have more vacancies or things like that, um, that there's a way to cover that. And so the lenders reduce their risk that way. Replacement reserves, you'll see sometimes these capitalize future um, building needs like replacement of roof, appliances, things that have a natural life cycle. Um, and then a lease up reserve, sometimes you'll see that covers, basically covers expenses as the property is getting leased up. So that's, you know, keeping the electric on, paying for the advertising, you know, as the property gets filled. Okay, so some takeaways for affordable housing finance. Um, these projects take multiple sources to achieve, um, local, state, federal, grants, private market, banks, investors, et cetera, all working together. Um, all funders have their own project requirements that the developer has to meet. This might be the size of the project, sustainability features, population, who's gonna live in the project. Um, it's, I say this a lot that it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. <laughs> Um, it's not unusual to take five or more years to get a project funded and construction started. Um, most affordable housing funding sources are constrained and highly competitive, right? So that goes to kind of why it takes so long. Um, and for us, looking at land cost and the allowed uses, that's critical to determining a project's feasibility, whether, whether it can work or not. Um, I'm going to go into zoning now a little bit. So zoning, if we talked about like what's needed for the car, it's like the, the funding and then the zoning. So here's the zoning. 
um, very critical to how we think about projects. So there's many paths to multifamily kind of depending on location. Um, so some places will have zones of their city or town zoned multifamily by right, which means you can build, you don't need a special permit to, to, to do, you still have to get the building approved by the um, building department, but you don't need a special ZBA or a special permit. Um, the next very common way is through a 40B. I think most people know are familiar with 40B, but I'll just say, you know, basically each municipality has to meet a 10% threshold of affordable housing on the state's subsidized housing inventory. Um, if not, a developer can create a development with an affordable housing component and override um, some of the local zoning laws. So this is really a process that's led by the developer. Um, you've probably heard of friendly 40B, which is where a developer, that's what we try to be, where we're working with a municipality to figure out, you know, like they want to do a project and here's a potential location and 40B is the way we would permit it. Um, sometimes not, sometimes projects come in and um, those tend to be the, the sort of larger projects and those are less friendly 40Bs, but it's the same process. Um, it requires the ZBA's approval. Um, and one thing I'll note here is that, um, you know, the even if the ZBA approves, um, that can be appealed. Um, so litigation can create lots of costs, um, can create lots of delay um, if litigation happens. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little more, but it's, it's um, that can be um, a real hurdle. Um, if there's a threat of litigation around a 40B. Um, another path is through 40R, um, which is uh, sort of called smart growth zoning. And that allows the town and municipality themselves to um, basically direct multifamily development to the locations where they want it to happen. So it's a case where actually spot zoning is allowed, um, particular sites, particular areas. Um, and the cool thing about that is that it comes with incentive payments to the municipality, both, for, that comes from the state, um, both when you create the zoning and then when you, when you um, award permits for the actual units. And this is a process that's led by the municipality. So we might have ideas about it, but it's really up to the municipality. It's a change to their zoning code. Um, so it's really led, led by them. Um, there's other, you know, paths, overlay districts, planned unit development. There's, you know, other different different types of um, things that may already be in the zoning code. Um, just a word on inclusionary zoning. Um, so some municipalities, probably many of you, have inclusionary zoning built into the zoning code, which basically means when, um, whenever some new market rate multifamily housing is built, usually above a certain size, maybe 10 units or greater, or whatever the threshold is. Um, that developer is required to include affordable units in the project, maybe 10%, maybe 15%, depends on where you are. Um, you know, this can definitely help meet affordability goals and spread units throughout multiple buildings. Um, you know, one thing I'd, I'd say is just to pay attention to how affordable the units have to be. Um, there's, we look at affordability in terms of something called AMI or area median income. So we think about you know, what, what level of income is that affordable to? So for example, our projects tend to be for families or individuals at 60% of AMI or below. Um, some inclusionary zoning may be for households um, up to 80% area median income. So you can see that that's less affordable than something that's at 60 or 50 or 30. Um, Another, uh, another sort of zoning thing that's come up in some communities is accessory dwelling units or ADUs, which basically allow for an additional small unit in an area zoned single family, sometimes called the granny flat. Um, and that creates sort of a more dispersed, sort of almost naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to mention, we'll be seeing more multifamily zoning uh, near transit going forward, which is, um, exciting for, <laughs> for me anyway. Um, part of the recently passed economic development bill in Massachusetts. Um, so that's really meant to couple some, you know, um, some additional housing right near transit, right near the commuter rail. And we actually have a couple projects that are transit oriented um, as well. So you'll see that. 
So takeaways on zoning. Um, so some sort of path to multifamily zoning is essential if you wanna create affordable housing. Um, the 40B process is a great tool, um, but there's risk involved with the threat of um, litigation and a threat of appeal to any CBA decision. Um, I just, you know, this is something that we, we talk about sometimes and ironically, the threat of litigation makes projects need to be larger in order to cover the legal costs to defend the decision. Um, so that's something, you know, we, if we think we're gonna get appealed, we have to know that we can cover those legal costs. Um, 40R again allows municipalities to decide where they want that multifamily and it provides incentive payments, um, creates a lot less risk for a developer coming in. Um, again, inclusionary zoning is another tool. I know MHP and MACDC are involved with that and can certainly provide help and guidance. Um, so I guess I would just say that zoning really, it's a really, really important tool. Um, sometimes not all that exciting to talk about, but it's a, it's a very important tool that can, that can really help um, or it, it can hinder the creation of affordable housing. And I'll pause before I jump into the case studies to see if there's any questions. So it's, it's looking good right now. We do have a question around um, local initiative program. And I don't know if you, if Harbor Light is um, specifically, uh, if you wanna speak more on LIP on LIPS. You know, I'm, I haven't, I don't have any expertise in those. So, so I did ask <laughs> my colleague, Katie Lacey, who is uh, listening, if she would um, attempt to respond to that question in the, in the chat. But otherwise um, you can just keep going, Kristen, thanks. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, great. So um, so our first case study is a project in Beverly called Two Hardy Street. And we've been, we sort of tagged it um, small but mighty. And I know, I think Alice Wong is here on the call, <laughs> but we worked closely together in putting together the, um, the perm loan uh, for this for this project. Um, so it's, it's new construction, it's a six two bedroom units. It's 100% affordable, supported by Section 8 vouchers. Um, and it's part of a funding program through DHCD called the Community Scale Housing Initiative, or CSHI, specifically for these sort of smaller projects. Okay, so again, it's six units, all two bedroom, family housing. Um, it's transit oriented development. It's right in downtown Beverly, very short walk to the MBTA commuter rail, really great location. Um, new construction, um, the total development cost is about $2.3 million, which equals about $385,000 per unit. That's all in. Um, funded through the Community Scale Housing Initiative. Um, it was uh, zoned, it was permitted as a special permit um, under some an inclusionary zoning rules within the city of Beverly. Um, and it's now complete and I'm happy to say 100% occupied. So just briefly, you can see through the, the sources and uses here, um, the local funding for six units was really quite robust. Um, this included community preservation funding, affordable housing trust funding within the city of Beverly and home funding, as well as the North Shore Home Consortium contributing to this project as well. So you'll see it's almost $100,000 per unit um, of local funding. Um, there's no tax credits involved with this. It's too small for tax credits. Um, DHCD does have some soft debt. That's that community scale housing initiative money that is in the deal. That's $900,000. Um, and then we're able to carry um, a conventional mortgage debt of $820,000. So those, those are the sources for this deal. Um, the site acquisition you'll see is very, very low. <laughs> um, the land was donated, basically donated to us in order to build these units. Um, the construction cost is the largest, um, largest, largest number here. Um, you see the overhead and fee. Um, and in this case, we did not do any capitalized reserves because the project was so small and HCP, we were able to guarantee the operations. So Kristen, before you move on, I'd like to actually like to bring up a few questions. 
Sure. Uh, so one, uh, how, how do nonprofits, how do you fund your pre-development and your planning work as a smaller nonprofit? Yeah, good. that's a great question. Um, so we are, we are forever grateful to CDAC. <laughs> Hopefully someone from CDAC is on this call. So they are um, an organization that provides both pre-development and acquisition loans on affordable housing projects. Um, so we work with them frequently. Um, you know, in the initial kind of kicking the tires on a deal, we will spend our own money on that. Um, you know, ordering an appraisal or doing some early, um, you know, having our civil engineer come and take a look. Um, we will come out of pocket for things like that. Once the deal is sort of shaping up into something real and feasible, then we'll start talking to CDAC about potential pre-development um, funding. So we're able to borrow, they, they become a bridge, right? So we're able to borrow um, funding from them. And then um, uh, until we get to the project sort of permanent sources, fully funded and closed, and then they get paid back. Great, thank you. There is a question about getting more into the weeds around tax credits, and I actually don't really wanna do that in this session because it's very complicated, so we could do that offline. Sure. Uh, but there is also a question, uh, if you would get a little bit, just explain a little bit more of the community scale housing initiative, that it, if you talk a little bit more about that as a funding source. Sure, yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, so um, a couple years ago, DHCD um, created this program called the Community Scale Housing Initiative, CSHI, basically to address um, the desire um, to, to have set funding, especially for smaller projects. So these may be projects, you know, that are not in the big cities that are out, you know, in different parts of the state or even within, you know, a city, but in a, you know, a very small sort of infill project like Too Hardy was. Um, and it's really designed for projects that are between, I think, five and um, five and 20 units. There's funding caps per unit. Um, it comes with, uh, or it can, when you apply for this type of funding, you can also request um, vouchers. So vouchers, like a Section 8 voucher, will stay with the project, ensure deep affordability, and also ensure a consistent revenue stream. Um, that allows us to have a perm loan. And is that the case with Hardy that you had vouchers? Yep. Connected yeah. to all six units? All six units, yep. So the units are affordable. They're, they're very, very deeply affordable to 30% and 50% of area median income. Um, so this, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a program that it, so as part of that, you're limited to which funding sources you can draw on. You don't have the whole sort of menu of different soft debt to choose from. It's just sort of one, the CSHI money. Um, you're, you don't combine it with tax credits. Um, and so um, when I get to the next, let's see, here we go, my next slide. Um, there's a bunch of things that have to happen to make it work. Um, so oftentimes we've been asked many times um, by different groups to say, can you do this small scale project for us? They want to put, you know, 10 units here. Um, we say, okay, we'll look at it. And for us to Hardy Street, this project here really demonstrated to us, you know, the things that need to be in place to make that work. Um, you know, number one, um, very, very low or no <laughs> acquisition cost is needed. Um, and this is simply because th this funding stream has caps, right? And you can't, you can't ask for more money than is available. Um, and so those caps don't support, you know, we can't pay $30,000 per unit acquisition cost. There's no way to, in the, within the funding source to support that. So the land has to be um, very, very low cost. Um, the other thing that we saw that was needed was really substantial local funding. Um, again, this was almost $100,000 of local funding per unit. They came out of the CPC, the Affordable Housing Trust, um, and both Beverly and Regional Home Funding. Um, like I mentioned, they make this soft debt, this CSHI funding available, um, along with another sort of component to making this work is um, project-based Section 8 vouchers. Again, those ensure, those do two things. Those allow us to serve, um, in this case, lower income families, um, 
and it allows us to have a you know consistent and predictable rent stream so that we can take on you know eight hundred thousand dollars of long-term debt um, and then the last piece here is you know it's really hard to take on zoning risk for six units um, in this case this this project these units were already permitted as part of a larger um, adjacent project, which you can see that top photo, you can see the larger sort of market rate project in the background. Um, so this came to us, you know, permitted with land um, and that really cut down on cost, but also risk. Um, and those, so these, you know, it's sort of like uh, the stars really have to align, I guess is the best way to put it, you know, to, to, to make this work. But when it does work, it's great because we were able to build these six units and sort of an infill place right downtown in the neighborhood. Does that answer? That's great. Yeah. All right. So just to sort of summarize to Hardy Street and small scale projects like this in general. Um, so they're too small for LIHTC. So there's limited funding sources. Um, you know, from an operational perspective, they're also more expensive to manage. There's the costs are spread over fewer units. So it tends to feel more expensive per unit to manage and operate. Um, I'll say just for my part, as much as I love doing this project, um, it, I, it would take me the same amount of work to develop these six units as to develop 60 units, <laughs> right? So if we're thinking about ways, we want to create as much affordable housing as we can. And so there's, um, you know, we want to make sure we're using all our resources well. Um, so it's, you know, it's a great, it's a really great project to do, but it's, it's interesting. It is like, it's basically the same amount of, amount of effort. Um, and the stars need to align these to work. Um, the municipality, in this case Beverly, was really great to work with. Um, you know, the, like I said, this was already zoned. There was a very clear zoning path with inclusionary zoning and special permit. Um, we were able to make these units with the Section 8 vouchers more affordable than the inclusionary zoning would have required them to be, and the planning department really understood the benefit of having deeper affordability and the need for affordable units on substantial local funding, which was committed early, um, writing numerous support letters. You know, I call it go, we're submitting a funding application. Can you give us a support letter? And you know, they were really helpful with that. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, we actually had a, a donor in this case, um, donate solar panels to the building, which is really, really exciting for us. Um, the building was not originally designed with a flat roof. So we had to change the design, which meant we had to go back through the design review board. Um, to, to do it, to present a flat roof design. And this is one of these things that like, it wasn't a stumbling block, but it could have been, right? To, to be able to get through that process. So there was a question about Beverly's Affordable Housing Trust and where do their funds come from? Um, so I, I do know that they have been able to get started, their trust has been able to get started with inclusionary payments that the city had through um, other developments. And so I don't think that they've yet distributed CPA funds, but they've had these other funds that they've used. I don't know if you know anything different, Kristen. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. I mean, and they do have they do have a pretty, um, pretty robust um, community preservation committee that does distribute funds. Great. Okay, um, my next case study is a project up in Rockport. It's called Granite Street Crossing. And, and this one I really wanna highlight um, the importance of you know working with your neighbors. Um, and you'll see how <laughs> this is really in the middle of a neighborhood. So you'll see that as we go through the project. This is new construction, um, 23 units. It's a mix of senior and family units. Um, it's 100% affordable. This has some supportive services on site. And this makes use of the, um, the LIHTC the 9% LIHTC. So here you can see um, the breakout of units. Basically, the, the I'll just go back to the site plan real quick here. The front part of the site has a larger building that has the 17 senior units. And the way the site is, um, it's kind of a funky shape. <laughs> so the back section there has um, six family townhouses that are sort of clustered around a lawn um, and a play area. Um, this is right near downtown Rockport, a very short walk to the commuter rail, um, new construction. The total development cost is just over $10 million, which works out to be about $441,000 per unit. Um, 
This uses the 9% low income housing tax credit financing. This was done through 40B zoning. And we just last week submitted this to the um, DHCD one stop funding round for our second time. Um, so the, the sources and uses here. So you'll see again on the sources side, um, pretty significant contribution of local money. That's mostly through um, the Rockport Community Development, uh, I'm sorry, Community Preservation Committee, um, and then the North Shore Home Consortium. They both, you know, the CPC funded this in three consecutive years, <laughs> each of which was approved by town meeting. Um, so they've really, they've really committed early, which is very helpful. Um, you can see next that the, um, that there is uh, also some, the low income housing tax credits here. Um, and I'm sorry, this, I put this in the wrong line item. There's actually not state LIHTC, that 2.7 should be the soft debt um, in this case. Sometimes, like I said, there are other affordable housing grants the Federal Home Loan Bank does a really great affordable housing program where they provide a grant um, as, also, as well as some subsidy on the, on the loan to lower your interest rate, which is great. So in this case, um, we, we have a half a million dollar grant from them. And then you'll see that uh, conventional long-term debt on the other side. So here, the acquisition was about $470,000. Again, CDEC helped us with that acquisition. Um, Construction cost, again, highest line item, and, and you'll see that we do have reserves on this project. Um, so these two pictures on the right give you, I think, a pretty good sense of where this site is. It sort of sits down, and then the surrounding houses, it's a really residential neighborhood, kind of sit right around it. In some cases, as you can see in that top photo, those neighboring houses are literally right on the property line. So we really invested um, a lot of work. I'll give a big shout out to our executive director, Andrew DeFranza, who had many, 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 many meetings, <laughs> um, reaching out to neighbors, talking about the project, trying to build support. Um, that lower, so that middle picture um, that's standing on a deck, that's actually standing on one of the neighbor's decks as we went out with our architect to look at sight lines. And we, you know, really did things like, okay, well, if we can adjust the height of the building a little bit, move it a little bit this way, what can we do for landscaping and fencing to really help this project sit within this neighborhood, you know, in a way that people are going to be comfortable with. Um, and of course, you can never make everyone happy, but as long as we feel like we're working together, we will, you know, we will really try, try hard um, to, to, you know, we'll always listen and we'll, we'll try hard to, to make things work um, as much as we can. Um, the town of Rockport, um, I, I don't know if anyone is here from Rockport, but I can't say enough good things about the town. They're, they're just really great to work with. Um, like I said, they committed that local funding early, um, which really helps us leverage the larger state funding. Um, the neighbors and the abutters really were willing to engage productively. And by that, I mean, um, there's always concerns when a, a housing project is coming in, there's, you know, which is totally valid. Um, and, uh, but, you know, in some cases we get a lot of like, we don't want anything here at all, no affordable housing at all. And that's kind of the end of the conversation. But in this case, really people were interested to come and talk about, you know, okay, well, how are you going to handle the, you know, bike storage on the site? How are you going to deal with like site lighting and is it going to be too bright or, you know, things like that, that are, you know, we can address those things, <laughs> you know, if the, if the, response is no affordable housing, you know, we, we can't really have a conversation there. So it was a really, a lot of really good, good conversations. Um, another thing I'll mention, so this is 40B. We went through that process with the ZBA. Um, and there was not, there was not something that comes up sometimes is really um, extensive, maybe excessive, um, depending who you talk to, <laughs> peer review. Um, of, of our work as part of the process, um, which is, you know, in this case, it was only required for the traffic um, engineer, um, which is, you know, appropriate, um, you know, and I think what we always say is, we, you know, the, the peer reviews come out of our budget. Um, we'd much rather provide enhanced landscaping <laughs> and use that money to pay for, for that kind of thing than peer reviews, but obviously sometimes they're important, but sometimes they can get um, excessive. Um, and I'll say that the CPC really has a really great leadership position. They advocate for affordable housing. I was in 
a meeting with them with our funding, you know, another funding application asking, you know, for more money, <laughs> which they did recommend. And they, they said, okay, well, when's your next affordable family project coming? When's the next one? So the CPC um, really, really has a great um, leadership role. So um, there's a question of asking about how large this parcel is. Yeah, it's about 1.3 acres. 1.3 acres. And so there also was a question with the kind of the context of how this development fits into the neighborhood, but these images help a little bit, I think, with that. Um, and you commented that you had this, the funding, the local funding was through the CPC, correct? Not a housing trust. Correct. Yeah. And you referenced going back a few times. Was that for specific elements of the development? Can you just explain that process a bit? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, no, we came in with our first application asking for the full amount that we were hoping for, um, $470,000. Um, and that for and that was very early on in the project. Um, so that first year, they awarded us $20,000, which really was a way to, they didn't want to tie up funding because they knew it was still a ways out. Um, but it was a way to make a nominal commitment and basically a nod to the local support saying, you know, we're in. Um, the following year, we came back <laughs> and uh, they awarded us another, I think, $250,000. Um, and then the third year, I was glad to see that they allowed me back in the room <laughs> where I asked for the balance um, and they were gracious enough to award it. So it was sort of a, a process of getting comfortable that the project was advancing. Um, you know, with other funding, um, you know, and also just that initial funding was really like, okay, so when we talk to the other funders, we can say that there's local funding committed, right? So even that nominal amount was very helpful to us to leverage conversations with other funders. And as a developer, can you just speak a little bit? There's a question about who initiates developments. Is it the developer or, or the town? Can you speak a little bit to that and whether it's private land or public land and your experience? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, so this, you know, this project and the next project we're gonna look at were both public land. I mean, private land, um, you know, so we, we kind of came with the development con concept um, and talking with the municipality. So it was really driven by us. I've definitely seen and worked on um, other projects that are more driven by the municipality, for example, um, a town has, you know, a decommissioned school that they want to redevelop as affordable housing, and they issue an RFP, um, and then we, and then we respond, we respond to it. Um, so um, it can really, it can really go both ways. You know, I think if a, if a municipality is working on, say, a 40R district or 40R zone. That's going to garner a lot of interest from not just us, but also from for profits, but um, who who are watching, um, you know, and interested in that kind of thing. I mean, I think for Harbor Light, it works fairly organically. We have a lot of, you know, everything is very local, so it's sort of it's you know a lot of conversation. We'll have, you know, many towns have um, a housing production plan. No, you know, hey, we really want to do something. We want to, what, what do you think about this parcel? What do you think about that parcel? We, you know, this is coming up. So we'll look at those things sort of all the time. And that's a case where it's, you know, it's really very um, collaborative. So we try to find something that would fit. So I just want to repeat that again, the funds in Rockport came from the Community Preservation Committee, not from the Housing Trust. There was another kind of question about that. And there's a general question that I don't know if you'd like to respond to, but someone is saying in their community, local developers aren't as interested in affordable housing. How would you suggest that the community find developers and kind of build relationships with developers like Harbor Light? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, really good question. I think, you know, I think one of the, you know, one short answer, which is a longer process is to really think about inclusionary zoning. If there's a lot of market pressure on development, that is a way to kind of build in some affordability. Um, you know, I think it sort of depends where you are within the municipality, if there's any degree to which, you know, there is maybe public land that's available that could be used for affordable housing. You know, doing an RFP process is another way to see, you know, who's out there. Um, and then I'll just, you know, add networking with, through, 
through MHP, through, um, through, through CDAC, through MACDC, um, through CHAPA. There's a lot of really great housing organizations where you can get connected with you know, really the vast array of not just developers, but lots of other people who are doing this work. Great, I'll just second that you could easily reach out to those of us at MHP and we'll do our best to connect you with different developers who might be interested in your community. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, sure. And I'm not sure, something green appeared on my screen. I'm not sure what that is, but I'll carry on. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So our third case study is um, for Anchor Point um, in Beverly. Um, this is really a great example of some kind of special regional planning that I wanna talk about. Um, this is new construction, it's 77 family units, totally affordable. 20% um, of these units are for homeless families. And I'll talk about why a little later. This is again, DHCD 9% LIHTC and it's gonna be built in two phases. Um, so here's the site plan. You can maybe see at the top, there's sort of an L-shaped building. That's phase one of the residential. The other L-shaped building is phase two of the residential. And then that third sort of square building or rectangular building is a community center. So it's 77 units, two phases of residential. It's totally family housing. It's all two and three bedroom units, um, really meant for families with children. 20% of the units will be for homeless families. We'll be providing pretty substantial supportive services on site to everyone who lives there. It's located in Central Beverly on a vacant site, vacant lot, it's new construction. The total development cost, pretty close to $19 million, which, which works out to be uh, just under $500,000 per unit. Um, you never wanna come in with a project that starts with uh, a five at that <laughs> TDC per unit cost. So, we're at 4.99, so we're pushing the edges of what's possible here. Um, we've got 9% LIHTC financing. The city also secured some MassWorks money, um, another funding source that can be driven by the municipality that's gonna provide some street and intersection improvements. This was zoned through a 40R smart growth overlay district that the city put into place. Um, phase one is funded, I'm really happy to say, and we're gonna be closing and starting construction in May. Okay, so in this case, um, again, you'll see pretty, pretty robust um, component of local funding. In this case, we have both federal and state LIHTC. Um, I, I'll just back up and say, again, that funding is a combination of Beverly CPC, Beverly Affordable Housing Trust, Beverly Home, and the North Shore Home Consortium. Uh, you'll see some so that soft debt there from, from DHCD. Um, and then our sort of conventional long-term debt at about 4.3 million. Um, the site acquisition cost, again, this was you know, sort of the, the market rate cost here that we paid for it. Um, and then the, the other costs kind of fall, fall into line. Construction, again, being, being the largest cost. And the one that gives me the most anxiety. <laughs> but our bids are in and we're on budget. Um, okay, so I'll just say, you know, so the funding, limitations of the state programs they you know they only have so much funding there's a lot of really great projects so they can't just you know in this case they couldn't fund both phases at once right it was just too big of a project so we have to break it into two phases of housing which you know is not ideal um, it's you know two separate closings it's to you know it does incur additional costs um, but because funding programs have caps that's we work within that um, I'll just say a word too about this community center, which we're calling sort of phase three. Um, there's a picture of it on the bottom right. It's envisioned sort of as a hub for providing services and activities for all the families who are gonna live here. It's got, it'll have a multi-purpose room, kitchen, classrooms, et cetera. Um, on the first floor, on the second floor, we're partnering with the YMCA to provide some on-site early learning childcare. Um, and on the third floor, we're looking to locate our HCP main office. Um, there's all kinds of playing fields, outdoor activities. Um, as awesome as this community center is, uh, and we love it and we're super excited about it, um, it is not supported by housing funding, right? So the housing funding, we have um, community rooms within the buildings, but something this substantial isn't, isn't supported by housing 
funding. So we're looking, you know, we're funding this through um, basically through uh, private philanthropy. Um, so this is a case where, you know, we love this, the city loves this, um, but we have to look for some other funding to make it happen. <clears throat> I mentioned MassWorks, which is a grant that municipalities apply for through the state. Um, it's, a, it's for infrastructure work. Um, and in this case, it was awarded to the city for their, there's a, an adjacent intersection um, that's very dangerous for pedestrians. And knowing that there's gonna be a lot of kids here, this location is just up the hill from the high school, um, lots of pedestrians. That was really important to us to make it safer to cross um, and important to the city as well. So they secured this grant to rework the intersection, um, to make it much safer for pedestrians and also do some sidewalk work, which is, you know, really dovetails with our project um, in terms of additional pedestrian access um, and just, you know, safety for all the kids who are gonna live there. So they're also, someone's also wondering about how large this site is. Yep, this one is about five acres. And can you just speak to a little bit of the significance of having section eight, a part of your project and how that impacts sources? Absolutely, yeah, let me just go back up real quick. Um, whoops. Okay, so in this case, it's important from two perspectives. Number one, that um, creating units specifically for homeless families, so it's gonna be about 16 units, um, is a really important part of the project and important part of addressing the regional need. Um, so those vouchers allow us to, you know, rent to people who are gonna have very, very low income, right? So um, the other piece that those vouchers do is they provide income then that is gonna support our long-term debt, which is $4.3 million. Um, you know, without those vouchers, you know, if we were looking at, um, what somebody could actually pay, maybe a family who's coming out of homelessness, it would obviously be much lower than what the voucher is. And that debt number would come down, right? So then we'd have a gap that we need some other funding for. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, great. All right. <clears throat> um, really great things, exciting things for us about Anchor Point. I think the 40R zoning was very, um, Innovative, again, it, there are benefits to the city financially. Um, they just go right, they don't go to the project, they go to the city um, payments. Um, and this really required political will and leadership um, from both the mayor and the city council in Beverly and other supporters. Um, and it really directs this multifamily housing where the city wants it. Um, this is really also a great example of some regional planning. Beverly, Salem and Peabody got together several years ago and signed an MOU um, regarding the creation of affordable housing and specifically creating units for um, homeless households, individuals and families. Um, and they agreed to all work together to produce um, units um, in their, you know, in their sort of region addressing the need. Um, Beverly is actually above 10% on the subsidized housing inventory list. Um, but, you know, because of this MOU and the mayor and other city leadership, um, they really, you know, they, they still wanted to do this project. So it really took, that's a great example, I think, of political will. Um, so again, very similar to some of the other projects, you know, there was a very clear zoning path through 40R, they reduced our risk. Um, they committed local funding early. Uh, the design review, you know, that comes up a lot. I'm a, I'm an architect, so I love design. <laughs> I hate saying the one you can't afford it, but um, you know, in this case, the really the city really and the design review board really understood some of the design changes that we came back to them with. Um, you know, when we first submitted this, the units had balconies. We were told like, no, that doesn't fit in the budget. That's not going to, you know, you can't have balconies. Um, so we had to make that design change, and the design review board really understood where that was coming from. Um, and then finally, the, really this sort of public political statement of support um, for housing for homeless um, individuals and families through that MOU really formed the base of, you know, what, what Anchor Point is. So in summary here, um, 
So some things that can create barriers to providing affordable housing, again, lack of zoning for multifamily projects, um, you know, peer review that sometimes gets a little out of control. Um, and like I said, we would much rather spend the money on enhanced landscaping <laughs> than, you know, um, lots of lots of reviews. Um, uh, threats of litigation, um, again, and, you know, litigation um, can be extremely expensive and, um, you know, can actually make projects larger if we feel like we need to cover legal costs. Um, a lack of local funding is difficult for us, not only that it creates a funding gap in what's needed to make the project work, but it's also the local funding is really important to the state in terms of local participation. Um, you know, active opposition, you know, to any kind of affordable housing and, you know, um, not having a willingness to engage in the conversation. Um, you know, and then if there's maybe sort of a lack of housing leadership um, within the municipality, but, and I'll just point out that the leaders um, can be from anywhere, right? It can be elected officials, it can be special groups or committees, it can be the ZBA, it can be groups of residents. You know, we've seen advocacy um, for affordable housing in lots of, lots of different forms. Um, and what helps affordable housing? Um, so I'm sharing this picture of our ribbon cutting. This was a project called um, Boston Street Crossing in Salem, which is um, units for homeless, uh, or, uh, formerly homeless individuals. And I'll just read it that everyone working together with a goal of creating affordable housing leads to ribbon cuttings, um, great projects, and what we all hope for, which is safe, secure, affordable housing. And this just gives you a sense of what a large team it takes to make it happen. Um, so the things that help, again, clear zoning or a path to permitting for multifamily work. Um, inclusionary zoning can be part of that toolkit. Um, political leadership to support affordable housing. And we saw at the case of the MOU that can happen regionally too. So it's, it doesn't have to be just within a certain town or city. Um, local funding committed early, which really helps us leverage larger state funding. Um, you know, the local community preservation committee, if, if your town or municipality has one, um, you know, when they really push for creation of new affordable units, like in Rockport, we really saw, you know, them play a very active role in supporting, you know, let's create more units, um, say a willingness to engage, um, you know, with developers, with, with other people, you know, in ways to improve a project and address concerns. I never want to downplay concerns because they're real. Um, but, you know, sometimes it can be a, you know, just no affordable housing. Again, that's really a hard conversation to <laughs> engage in. Um, and I think just understanding, you know, the, the, the lots of different interests and lots of different competing interests sometimes that the developer faces when we're coming up and working on affordable housing projects. Um, you know, for example, sometimes this happens in the, um, the, the design review, you know, there's, um, the need for a sustainability element can contrast with what the um, sort of facade is supposed to look like can be in conflict with what the funding source says. So understanding we're trying to balance a bunch of those things together. Um, and then even just as simple as providing support letters when we're doing our funding applications, those really count and those are very helpful. Um, okay, so that's, that's it for me. There's my, this is our two Hardy Street project during we were able to continue construction um, in sort of a scaled back way during COVID, for which we're very grateful. Um, here's my contact information, my email. Feel free to please feel free to reach out. And um, thanks for letting me share. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Kristen. We do have a few minutes, so I want to ask if there are any questions. No. And if you want to actually unmute yourself and ask a question at this point, that'd be fantastic. I have a question. Can you talk about the, um, you said that home funding is a local source and I'm curious about that. I thought that was a DHCD source. Can you talk about um, how communities um, go through the process of becoming home funders? Yeah. Oh, I, I'm absolutely happy to chime in on that. So the home money comes from, it's actually a federal source. It comes from HUD, but then it's allocated down to the state um, and then further allocated down to the municipalities. So each municipality gets, um, depending on, I, I forget what the criteria is, if it's a combination of population and some other factors, 
an allocation of home funding each year. Um, so um, you're right, the DHCD has a pot of home funds that they can award as part of that soft debt. Um, and then um, Shelly, feel free to jump in here, but the, each municipality also gets home funds that they can use. If they don't use those home funds, they roll over to a, um, a regional sort of collection of home funds in our geography, that's the North Shore Home Consortium. Um, and then they can allocate funds to projects. Shelly. Shelly, can I jump in? Laura. Yes, please, please. Um, just to clarify, Kristen, um, home funds only go to entitlement communities. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. That's okay. And communities that are not um, entitlement communities can join together to form a consortium, which is what the North Shore has done and the Cape has done and some other uh, communities have done. And then that consortium of communities then would get an entitlement um, they would then reach the population or um, goal, you know, uh, thresholds, and they would then get a direct. Otherwise, communities have to apply to DHCD. Smaller communities have to apply for DHCD for, for funds. Just a clarification point. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying. That You're welcome. I've been lucky enough to work with um, entitlement communities who have their own home funding. Thanks for clarifying. And that explains it. Where I live, there are no entitlement communities. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And one comment is that Roberta brings up is that different home consortia may have different um, distributing um, processes as well. So Kristen, would you speak to um, the uh, average local funding per unit? Like in your experience and the projects that you've received local funding, um, what is it, what do they typically, typically contribute per unit or is there anything that's typical? It really depends. I mean, I think just amongst these three projects, it goes from, you know, maybe $20,000 per unit to $100,000 per unit. In a larger project that has a greater variety of funding um, options, you know, the, the local commitment per unit can be smaller. Um, in that very small scale project, that two party street six unit project, we really needed substantial local funding. Um, to make that work. So that's a case where it was, you know, $100,000 per unit, which is, which is on the high end. Can you just say again, why, when it's a really small project, you need greater local contribution, greater subsidy? Absolutely, yeah. It's because there's, we have a limit on which funding sources we can use. So on a smaller project like that, we can't access um, some of the big, you know, if you remember, like the um, the low income housing tax credit is typically like a pretty large percentage of our sources. Um, but in a small scale project, we can't access that funding. It's not available for smaller projects. So we are more, um, we have to fill the gap somehow, right? So um, part of that, you know, at Two Hardy Street was, oh, acquisition cost of $100. That helps. <laughs> fill that gap, but um, there's just limited state resources for smaller scale projects. And that means greater local commitment is needed. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from anyone in the audience? Either in the chat or you can um, unmute yourself. Oh, so, you know, partly why I appreciate the developer perspective is because on the, when we're in the middle of it on the local level, sometimes we can forget that a developer is really in between kind of a rock and a hard place sometimes where they have a variety of demands on their, um, on them. And so it's not just the local preferences, but it's lenders. And as we saw, there are a lot of different lenders in a lot of different funding sources with affordable housing. And then there's also the state and the state has different requirements as well. So. I thank you, Kristen, for taking the time to put the presentation together and for sharing with us some of your experience on the North Shore and you had great examples. Um, so this is the third in our four point series. The taping will be put on the housing toolbox. I think that Katie Bossy put the link in the website, but you can go to housing toolbox um, for Massachusetts communities and you can find it there. Um, we have our fourth session next week and we're gonna be hearing the community perspective. So we're gonna be hearing from Salem and from Brewster about how those municipalities are actively supporting affordable housing. So we hope that you'll join us again next week, but that's all for us today. We thank you so much for being with us and thank you, Kristen.
Yeah, thanks everyone. It's great to see some uh, familiar faces and new faces in all these little boxes. So thank you. Thank you very much.